One of the things that um, John Dalton said in his atomic theory was that all atoms of a given element are exactly the same, which implies that they have the same mass, right? We now know that that's not completely true because different isotopes have slightly different masses, right? So because there are different isotopes, we need to know the average mass for an atom of that element because very rarely do we deal with individual atoms. If you're dealing with single atoms, then yeah, you need to know which isotope it is to know what its mass is. But generally, we're, we're dealing with a sample that contains like five gabillion of those atoms. So what we want is the average. So the average mass we call the atomic mass, and we can calculate that for each atom. <coughs> That's listed under the element symbol. So under the element chlorine, um, symbol for chlorine, we see 35.45. That is the average mass of chlorine atoms. There are no chlorine atoms with that exact mass. That's the average. The average is based on the natural abundance of each different isotope. There's an isotope of chlorine that weighs closer to 35 atomic mass units and one that's 36 atomic mass units. The average is 35.45. Now, if you look on the periodic table on the wall under chlorine, it says 35.453. And another periodic table you might find might have more digits. So sometimes, like on, the on my favorite and I do have a favorite periodic table. Um, on my favorite periodic table, it just gives four significant figures for all the masses. Because most of the time, that's good enough. What I would encourage you to do is whatever periodic table you're using, use all the digits shown on that periodic table. In lecture, I'm typically going to use four because I have a lot of them memorized. And it just makes things go much faster. So those are calculated. How do you calculate them? Well, let's look at chlorine. <coughs> oh, there isn't 36. There's only 37. So there's two isotopes. There's chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So the mass of each of these isotopes in atomic mass units is going to be very close to its mass number. Not exactly the same, but really close to. So here, 36.97 ato atomic mass units for these chlorine-37 atoms, 34.97 AMUs for the chlorine-35. But 75.77% are chlorine-35, and 24.23% are chlorine-37. So normally when we do an average, we take the individual numbers, and we add them all up, and we get a total, and then we divide by how many numbers there were, right? That's called a simple average. Here, if we were to add up all of the numbers, uh, we, we wouldn't finish before we died of old age or boredom. Um, it's not possible. So we use what's called a weighted average. So we use the percent abundance. So 75.77% are this mass. So that means that they contribute 75.77%. And this other atom contributes the remaining 24.23%. So we take the percent abundance and convert it to decimal form. All we're doing there is dividing by 100, taking a percent, and now we're expressing it as the fraction out of 1. You take the fractional abundance, multiply by the mass of that element, you get a number. You take the fractional abundance of the other isotope, multiply by its mass, you get a second number, then you add those together. We don't need to divide by the number because the weighted, the, the percent takes care of that. So then we add those two together and we come up with 35.45 atomic mass units. The average mass, like I said, there's no single chlorine atom that weighs 35.45 atomic mass units. There's almost 37 and there's almost 35. Yep. So if on the homework they give us a problem with just chlorine 37 and they didn't give us 36.97, would it be safe? 
Yeah, so what if, what if they talk, were talking about chlorine-37 on a homework problem and they didn't give you the atomic mass? If they're not giving it to you, then, yeah, the safest thing would be to say, well, it's not going to be exact, but I'll just use 37 atomic mass units. Close enough. Yeah. If they want you to be more precise, they'll have to give you the numbers. Because it's not, I mean, you can look these things up, but it's not, not something you would do normally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so carbon-13, what would the mass of that be? 13. It'd be really close to 13 atomic mass units. <coughs> the only one that's right on is carbon-12. Because of how the atomic mass unit was defined, a carbon-12 atom weighs exactly 12 atomic mass units. And they, they just chose that because you have to start somewhere. And so that's the point of reference because carbon is plentiful and stable and it's easy to work with. So they reference everything to carbon. Any other questions? So this is the general form for calculating the atomic mass. And this is going to show up in the worksheet. Um, and you've probably already looked at some homework problems. So. Um, the fancy math way of expressing this is this is the sum of the fraction abundance of the first isotope times its mass. And then for each isotope, you do that same thing, the fraction times its mass, and then you add them all up, however many there are. Some elements have two isotopes. Others might have three or four. And you can't predict any of that by looking at the periodic table. Less fancy. You just take the fraction of the first one times its mass plus the fraction of the second one times its mass, etc. <coughs> so let's do an example. Magnesium has three naturally occurring isotopes. So they're giving us the masses. They just list them off there. 23.99, 24.99, and 25.98. And then they give us the natural abundances um, 78.99, 10%, and 11.01% respectively. So that word respectively means that they're giving us the percent abundances in the same order as they gave us the atomic masses. So this first one, 78.99, is the percent for the 23.99 because they're first in the list. Okay, The second in the list go together and then the last ones. And so we're asked to calculate the atomic mass of magnesium. Well, do we have to calculate the atomic mass of magnesium if we want to know what it is? No, we could just look at the periodic table, and there's the answer. But we want to look at the process. So if this was a homework problem, you can't just write down what's on the periodic table, or if it's an a exam problem. You have to show your work and demonstrate that you know how to do the, do the problem. So we're going to take... The um, fractional abundance of the first one and convert it to a fraction, dividing by 100. So we've got 0 0.7899 times the mass of that one, 23.99 atomic mass units, plus the fraction of the second one, 0 0.1000, times the mass of the second one, plus the third one times the mass of the third one. I know some people are very resistant to writing stuff down. So why do I have to write it out? Why do I have to show my work? I can just do that on my calculator. That's great if you can just do it on your calculator. But part of learning science is learning how to write down stuff so that you can show someone else Maybe decades later, years after you're dead and gone, they can look back and see, oh, this is how they got that. Okay? And I know we're not doing any, anything new in here. It's all old stuff. But the process is important of learning to write things down. It is to your advantage to write this down because if you make a mistake, you can go back and look and find the mistake and learn from it and also save time by not having to start all over. Sometimes it's just a, a matter of you put it into your calculator wrong. Other times you might have like transposed digits or, or done something like that. Always write stuff down. 
as you're doing your online homework, I encourage you to have a notebook where you write your work out, because then you can go back and see what you've done. And then if you have trouble and not, you're not getting the right answer, you can send me a picture of your work, and I can help you figure out what's wrong. Okay, so let's do this math. 0.7899 times 23.99 plus 0.1 times 24.99 plus 0.1101 times 25.98 equals. Okay, so my calculator is showing me 24.3090.99. The unit would be atomic mass units. Anybody have any questions? Does this match up with what's on the periodic table? This periodic table says 24.3051. My answer was 24.309. It's not exactly the same. It's really close, though. What about significant figures? This gets kind of messy because we've got multiplying and adding, and I know that that's hard, right? It's icky. These sorts of calculations are really to understand the process, and so I'm not going to be nitpicky about sig figs on here. What I'd like you to do is be reasonable. So our percent abundances had four significant figures. Our masses had four significant figures. So it's probably not realistic that we've gained a bunch of significant figures. Our masses went to two decimal places, and now I've got six decimal places. That's not very reasonable. So a reasonable rounding of this would be 24.31 atomic mass units. That may or may not agree with the strict rules of sig figs. I don't feel like doing it. You probably don't either. But that's, that's close. Comparing this to the one on the, on the wall, if we rounded that to two decimal places, we'd come up with 24.31. Okay. This calculation was not done with the most precise numbers. We know the masses of these isotopes to more decimal places. We know their abundances to more decimal places. But it gets tedious. And so that's why it doesn't come out exactly to what's on the wall. Any questions? Anybody curious how they figure out what these different atoms weigh? Well, I'm going to tell you even if you aren't curious. Um, so mass spectrometry is a technique used to separate particles according to their mass. So we can do this with atoms. We can also do it with molecules. And you'll get a result something like this. You'll get um, relative intensity of the signal, and, um, and then you'll get the different masses. So this instrument will separate these two isotopes, chlorine-35 and chlorine-37. And based on the relative heights of the peaks that we get here, we can deduce the percent abundance of each of them. So here's just an overview of how this works. It's really pretty cool. So the sample is sent in here. And um, there's a heater here that vaporizes it. So you can send in um, a liquid or a finely divided solid, and it's going to get heated and, and vaporized into the gas state. Because you can't have liquids, just they're not going to go anywhere. So you vaporize them. They go through here where we have an electron beam that ionizes the sample. That's going to knock an electron off or put electrons on, generally put electrons on. So it's going to give it a negative charge. And then we've got electrically charged plates that we can use to accelerate the particles. So we have to put an electron on there so that we can make the particles move faster. Otherwise, the atom's just going to hang out there in the gas state and not going to do what we want. By putting a charge on it, then we can control its movements. So we speed it up. We send it through here. And then we run it through this magnetic field. 
the magnetic field is going to separate the particles based on their um, mass to charge ratio. So heavier particles are going to be, their, their path is going to be changed less, and lighter particles are going to have their path changed more. And so based on where it hits on the detector, we can get the, the masses of those different particles. Any questions? We actually have a mass spectrometer in the instrument room attached to our gas spectrograph, so it's pretty cool.